and friends joining with us to pray. Uh, One verse from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. And uh, our friends in India are in trouble. Praise God we have an ever-present help in God, our refuge and strength. Let me open the night with prayer. Uh, Would you join me now? Our Father God, we thank you that we can call you that, uh, our Father in heaven, because of the Lord Jesus Christ. So thank you that we are your children and you are our Father God and that you invite us to pray. Our Father, we commit this night to you now. Uh, We pray that uh, we may pray to you as people who know you through Christ and who know that you are strong and and as people who know that you are kind. Uh, May we know, Lord, that you will listen to our prayers, that you love to hear the prayers of your people. Uh, So, Father, please, uh, tonight, uh, hear us as we cry out to you in pain for the people of India. Um, We pray, Lord, that our prayerfulness and our support of our friends in India would not just be for this hour tonight, but that we'd be encouraged from tonight to continue to remember our friends, to continue to uphold India in prayer and to continue to think about how we can support uh, your work there. Um, so, Father, at the, at the beginning of this night, we commit it to you and pray that you'd be glorified in our midst in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me invite Rohina to come up, please. Rohina is a member of one of our churches, Newington Anglican Church. Uh, Rohina works as a public health doctor, um, and she's from India originally. She's really well-placed. to Tell us a bit about the situation. So I've just asked Rohina to take five minutes Tell us a bit about what's happening in India to inform our prayers. Thanks so much, Rohina. Thank you, Tim. Thank you all for coming today and joining us online to support the Indian diaspora and uphold India in prayers. Um, So Tim's asked me to give just a quick update, a brief update on what the current situation is. So by official stack counts, India has reached 23 million people affected by COVID. That's one Australia. Of these, 19 million have recovered, but sadly 250,000 people have died. Now, as I say these figures, please note that these are the official stats. Even in pre-COVID days, 60% or more of people in India die at home, and there are no medical certificates. So we will never know the absolute number of people who have been impacted by COVID, either by uh, just the disease or by mortality. Um, Now, in the last week, India averaged at 380,000 new cases and 4,000 deaths due to COVID every single day. Again, these are all undercounts. So these are the official stats. Now, as the virus travels to rural India and remote India, we will never ever know those numbers because testing is extremely rare and the services are weak in in these rural regions. Now, even when we look at urban centers in India, um, the health system is literally on its knees. Hospitals have had to refuse patients because they don't have beds. Uh, Oxygen and medicine supplies are depleted. And as you have seen in the media, crematoriums are running at 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In fact, people have had to queue up with their loved ones to find a spot. On a personal note, I've had friends whose entire families have been affected by COVID. Um, The father-in-law of one of my friends died due to COVID last month. Um, My colleague in India, his father died after 12 days of hospitalization. And this morning we heard, you know, someone who used to help my parents back in India in their house, his mum died two days ago, and today we heard that his father died. So in a span of three days, he's lost his mum and his father. But amongst this corruption and black marketing of medicines and oxygen, uh, and, and just complete desperation, there are also stories of hope and little rays of sunshine, and I want to share this with you. It's the health professionals. They are going above and beyond their calling. They never trained for this, but they, are, they have just stepped up. They've risen to the occasion, and they are working 
the way the civil society has banded together to help complete strangers is inspiring. Um, they've organized food, medicines, oxygen, ICU beds. When they found that pets, you know, uh, nobody is alive in the household, they've formed ways to adopt these pets uh, to, in families uh, where, uh, you know, where, where people love these dogs and cats. And people also call up when they are, you know, others when they are broken. Now, as a family, uh, we've experienced God's love and mercy. Now, in the background of the rising second wave in India, my parents who are here with us today migrated from India to Australia. And just 24 hours after their departure, the airlines stopped flying out of India. So we understand the stress of being left behind, but we also understand God's mercy and love. Um, my parents' journey to Australia was a complete miracle. Joe's parents, my parents-in-law, and extended family and friends are in India. I want to encourage us all to pray. Uh, please pray for the country to be vaccinated, to follow public health advice, uh, for the health workers to be able to deal with the physical and mental load each and every day, for the government and the leaders to have the wisdom to lead the country out of this crisis, for families who have lost someone close to them or who have family members who are unwell. Please reach out to the Indian diaspora here uh, who have got families in India uh, or colleagues. You know, you've got friends and colleagues at work. Reach out to them because just a simple hello, how are you, goes a really long way. So thanks, Tim, and thanks, Church, for, uh, for praying for India and for this opportunity to share. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rohina. That really informs our prayers. It helps us so much when we come to pray in a little while. There are so many things from what Rohina said that can uh, stimulate our prayers. So thank you very much, Rohina. So helpful. I'm going to hand to Ben now. Ben George, who is a part of our church at Auburn Anglican Church um, and a trained minister of the gospel uh, through Moore College. I've asked him to preach from the Bible. So Ben's going to uh, come and share with us from God's word uh, to encourage us. Thanks, Ben. Thanks. Well, thanks, friends, for coming along. Uh, and it really is a privilege to open God's Word with you just for a few moments this evening. Uh, and when, I, when Tim called on Sunday uh, and said, oh, we should do this thing and we should, you know, can you preach? Uh, I wasn't sure what to preach on. It's a bit difficult to figure out what to preach on in a situation like this. Uh, and then actually, as I was reading through a few things and things I'd read recently, I thought actually of looking at the book of Lamentations. Uh, and so for a few moments, I think that's what it would be helpful for us to look at, uh, because I want to wrestle with the reality that at the moment, for many of us, things are just very, very difficult. Uh, we have family and friends, loved ones in India and in other countries who are suffering terribly. And the reality is that when they suffer terribly... We suffer terribly. Uh, we, have, uh, we, we can't be there for funerals. We can't be there to, to take care of those who are sick. We can't just be there with those whom we love who are struggling where deadly disease is running absolutely rampant. And when these sorrows come, it is good and right and appropriate for us to mourn. Uh, and it might draw us to ask questions of how a line like this, which will come up on the screen, how this can be said, these famous words, which come from Lamentations chapter 3, uh, verse 22 to 24, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And as we look at Lamentations just for a few minutes, I want to work through how it is possible for us to say that when what's happening in the world is actually happening and is impacting us directly. Uh, how is it possible that people who suffer can have these words on their lips and actually mean it? For you see, the situation in the book of Lamentations when it was written uh, was, was all about suffering. The suffering was a little bit different. In Lamentations, we have a collection of responses to the complete and utter destruction of the city of Jerusalem by the king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, in 587 BC. 
And, and before we get to chapter 3, we actually see very clearly that God's people, Israel, they understand that they are being judged by God. They understand that something is definitely wrong. Very quickly, chapter 1, verse 5, The Lord has made her suffer for the multitude of her transgressions. The, the, the people know that this means the destruction of hope. Everything has been systematically demolished. And that has been recognized in these opening verses as being the purposes of God decided ages ago. So you look at chapter 2, verse 17. The Lord has done what He purposed. He has carried out His word, which He commanded long ago. He has thrown down without pity. He has made the enemy rejoice over you and exalted the might of your foes. And as we just think about this in chapters 1 and 2 of Lamentations, it's almost like the question comes out to us. If God is against us, who can be for us? And yet faced with such utter hopelessness, when every structure of the world has clearly failed, and even God has been encountered only for judgment and the people, they know it. We do not find despair, we find hope. We find hope in God. It says, look, O Lord, and see. That's how the people of Jerusalem cry as they suffer. And in chapter 3, what's even more remarkable and helpful for us as we try and think through these things is that actually we move from the cries of collectively the people to the suffering of an individual man. And that's really helpful for us because he's an individual like us. And he's an individual who expresses suffering more generally. A typical way that an ancient Israelite would express suffering. This is the type of suffering we see all throughout the Bible. In, in the Psalms of Lament, when they cry out, How long, O Lord? The suffering that could be heard on the lips of Job as he suffered. The type of, su the, the type of suffering that we might express when we just don't know where to turn. These are the suffering words of a man who knows and expresses suffering because of rebellion against God. And I don't mean rebellion against God, suffering because of individual sin. You did something and so now you're getting punished. I mean suffering because of the brokenness of the world. Because of the sin that Genesis 3 speaks about. Because we are not connected to our life source. Because this world is crying out in eager anticipation of a reconciliation with God, our maker. And so hear the suffering words of this man. And for most of this you should know I'm just going to read what Lamentation says. Because it's just so helpful for us to hear. Suffering words of the man. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy, though I call and cry for help. He shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked. He is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He turned aside my steps and tore me to pieces. He has made me desolate. He bent his bow and set me as a target for his arrow. He drove into my kidneys the arrow of his quiver, I have become the laughingstock of all peoples, the object of their taunts all day long. He has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me with wormwood. He has made my teeth grind on gravel. He has made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say, my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. Do you see the personal anguish that's there? Now, some of this language, obviously, we wouldn't say. I'm not sure I've ever said, and the arrows quiver in my kidneys. But nonetheless, there is some language there that is clearly language that we can express when we see this sort of suffering. When you know of family members, direct family members that are dying, and not only can you not go and help them, but you can't even go and mourn at a funeral, how can you not say, I have forgotten what happiness is? 
My endurance has perished and so has my hope in the Lord. That's, that's a real feeling that this guy has. Perhaps as you consider all that is happening with friends and family, with loved ones in India, this man expresses the phenomenon of personal suffering in the world just like you would express personal suffering in your world. And this is not the first time that individuals have said throughout the course of history these words, my expectation, my hope from the Lord has been completely destroyed. And you see in verse 19, then you see the man, he moves. So the first 18 verses are this. And then in verse 19, he moves beyond judgment and destroying of hope. And here we have the response to this utter hopelessness that we are invited to share in. He moves from hopelessness to having hope. And he does it very quickly. Have a look at this, verse 19. Remember, he prays. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Do you see the change all of a sudden? Verse 18, his hope has perished. So I say, my endurance has perished and so has my hope in the Lord. Verse 21, but this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. His experience around him is very clearly that there is no hope. But when he calls to mind the truths of God, suddenly hope comes. Verse 22, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Now, friends, you must understand how profound this change is. In these words, right here, in the rich, merciful, loving kindness and faithfulness of God we can actually find hope. Find hope in the midst of utter and complete hopelessness. This man has learned, as the people of Israel have learned, that it is only in the steadfast love and faithfulness of the Lord that hope may be found. You see, it can't be technology and medical advancement. It doesn't seem to have helped. Then verses 25 to 30 draw out how we can be confident of such truths. The man doesn't just stop there. He then bursts out, in a way, into more truths. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. To the soul who seeks him, it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes and let him be filled with insults. The, the experienced reality of God's judgment, it really must not blind us to the overwhelming reality, the more important reality, the persistent reality in all of Holy Scripture, clearly testified that the mercy and faithfulness of God is bigger than the suffering that we face because of our broken relationship with our Maker. This is fundamental. And the guy goes on to explain why. Verse 31 to 36, he says, For, which basically means you figure out why he's saying something, For the Lord will never cast off forever. But though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. To crush underfoot all the prisoners of the earth. To deny a man justice in the presence of the Most High. To subvert a man in his lawsuit, the Lord does not approve. And if all of this is true, verse 37 to 40, who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? It is not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come. Why should a living man complain, a man, about the punishment of his sins? And then verse 40 to 47, the language changes again from the individual to the community. They come back in, and now God's people together, they say and they express their truth in light of this testimony. Verse 40 and 41, let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. 
Let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. Their response to hearing this reality, that yes, it's difficult, and yes, it's something we can't get out of, but God is more powerful, is that they lift their hands to heaven. And then from verse 47 to the end of the chapter, the individual individual man comes back on the scene. And now his tone moves. So he started with individual lament, how difficult everything was. And now it is individual thanksgiving. Now he testifies about the deliverance that he knows with great confidence. And I think it's summarized beautifully in verse 57. You came near when I called you. You said, do not fear. See, friends, the reality is that the individual of Lamentations 3 echoes and anticipates the experience of Christian men and women like you and I that are here today and those of you watching on live stream. It is an experience of Christian men and women who ourselves echo the pioneer of our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus too entered suffering. Jesus saw affliction. Jesus stood under the wrath of God. And he too clung to faithfully the mercies of God. And as the pioneer of our salvation, this Jesus Christ has seen the deliverance of the mercies of our great God ultimately and finally. We don't do this alone. You see, we know of our Lord Jesus Christ who has gone this way before us, who takes us with him through the judgment and beyond it into redemption and love. As we look to Jesus, we see the reality of God's judgment and the response that is brought forth in faithful hearts. We see around us people who know we have sinned. And so they appropriately turn back to God in repentance. And when we do this, we see our own experience. And so friends, how much more than us, we who know the loving kindness and mercy and faithfulness of our God in the Lord Jesus Christ, how much more should we not show our trust in Him through praying to Him? We pray as we remind ourselves of these truths in the quietness of our heart, and we sing them on our lips in praise. See, these are the truths that we can sing Not only because Lamentations, even though Lamentations was enough, but even more so. How much more? Because we know of the Lord Jesus Christ. And knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, how can we not but say this? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Amen. Thanks so much, Ben, for serving us, teaching us God's word. Thank you, brother. And yes, as you've just said, we've seen God's mercy supremely in the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. So all glory be to Christ. I'll invite Sean to come forward, our music leader here in Auburn Anglican Church, in Newington Anglican Church. Sean is going to play this song. We might stand up, friends. We can't sing because of COVID um, for at least this week. Hopefully we can next week. Um, but Sean's, Sean is going to sing, and uh, we will be encouraged as we um, ponder the words of this great song, All Glory Be to Christ. Please stand.
so much. Thanks, friends. Have a seat. Take a seat. All right, we're going to pray now. Uh, we're going to open it up to prayer. Uh, we've thought about the problem. Rohan has helped us with that. Uh, we've heard about our God, the answer, the one to come to in prayer, the God of mercy. Ben has helped us with that through God's word, and Sean has helped us with that as we've reflected on God's truth in song. Uh, it's right to pray to God. That's what we're going to do now. And uh, I'd love you to lead us if you're comfortable to do that, friends. Just come up and use the microphone and lead us in prayer for some part of uh, the problem in India for our Indian friends. We've, we've got There's lots of things that we can pray for. We've had lots of ideas already uh, tonight of uh, things that we can pray for. Uh, two people are going to kick us off, Trinita and Jason, uh, two friends from our church. Uh, are going to lead us in some prayers for India. So they'll kick us off. And after that, friends, it's an open mic. So as I said, uh, please feel comfortable to come forward and lead us. Don't feel pressured, but feel comfortable too. Uh, I'll certainly be very happy to jump up and lead in a couple of prayers, and others will as well. But if you would like to, uh, we'd be blessed. Thanks, Trinita. Please join me in prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for all the blessings you have showered upon us. Today we have gathered here to pray for those around the world now struggling with COVID-19, and especially at this time for the nation of India. Heal and comfort those who are sick and suffering. May your healing hands rest upon the Indians. Take away the fear, anxiety, and feelings of isolation from people receiving treatment or under quarantine. Give them a sense of purpose in pursuing health and protecting others from exposure to the disease. May your grace flow through the people of India who has lost their loved ones. May you comfort the depth of every soul, clean them, purify them, and restore them. Fill them with light and hope Please give up the governing authorities wisdom in the management of this crisis and give to your people your peace beyond understanding, wise hearts, and a renewed trust in your sovereign goodness and glory. We pray especially for uh, the President Ramnath Kovind, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, and his government. We give each and every state and their chief ministers in your hands. Give them all wisdom and wise counsel that they may lead their communities and respond to this crisis with generosity. Enable India's leaders to properly resource and support all the necessary services, such as hospital beds, antiviral drugs, oxygen, and vaccines. Dear God, I pray that your wisdom be bestowed upon the citizens of India to follow COVID-19 protocols, such as wearing masks, maintaining physical distancing, and sanitizing hands, as well as adhering to restrictions and curfews imposed to break the chain of the infection. God, as more people get sick, healthcare workers and first responders are working longer hours with fewer supplies and with more risk of contracting the coronavirus themselves. Renew their energy and sustain them on long shifts. Bring your protection upon them as they work with patients. Multiply the supplies so they have the protective items needed to stay safe on their job. Jesus, we thank you for your faithfulness in how you have guided and equipped people in their jobs and have provided in the past. As people feel financial strain during the uncertainty, bring them comfort and peace, reminding them that you are there for them. Provide for them in their times of need. 
I will say of the Lord, you are my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Please forgive all our iniquities and have mercy upon us. In the name of Jesus who cares beyond all. Amen. Uh, friends, let's continue in prayer. In Psalm 130, verse 1, the psalmist cries out, From the depths of despair, O Lord, I call for your help. Hear my cry, O Lord. Pay attention to my prayer. Father God, we cry out to you at this time. We thank you that you are a generous and kind Father, that you have a generous and kind heart towards your people. Thank you that every good gift comes from you. And thank you that you do sovereignly care for and provide for all people. Father, at this time, our hearts grieve for the terrible crisis happening in India at the moment. Our hearts break for those who are suffering in indescribable ways. And we long to see these and all sufferings come to an end. Father, at this time, we particularly pray for those who are suffering, for those who are sick, and for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Father, for those who are suffering, we pray that you would show your mercy to them. Uh, there is so much suffering happening in India at the moment, Father, not just from COVID, but people's livelihoods being taken away, uh, the nation being crumbling before them. Uh, Father, people do desperately need you. We pray that you would pour out your mercy upon the nation of India, uh, that you would, in your kindness, bring an end to the suffering, uh, that you would be providing for those who are in need, uh, strengthening people. And we pray, Father God, that those who are in leadership positions may use their leadership to bring suffering to an end. Father, we do pray particularly that Christian people in India would be sharing the love of Christ, uh, that at times when suffering is so bad, we pray that Christians will be those who stand out as those who share the love of Christ and um, suffer alongside those who are, who are struggling. Father, please, you who know uh, what it is to suffer in the, in the person of our Lord Jesus, uh, we pray that you would bring this to an end and that you'll be drawing people to yourself. Uh, Father, for those who are sick, we pray for your mercy. We pray for your provision of medicine, uh, for your mercy upon the medical system, that it will be caring for those who are struggling. And we pray, Father God, that you'll be healing the uh, many people who are infected with COVID. Uh, Father God, please be providing hope for those who are there. Please be providing oxygen. Uh, please allow the, the COVID vaccine to be widely spread. And we pray, Father God, that you would bring an end to this pandemic as only you can. We pray again that Christian people would be those who would uh, be caring for the sick. Uh, we thank you that in history past, Christians have been known as those who uh, will put their lives at risk to care for those who are sick, those whom the rest of society casts out. And we pray that at this time in India, it would be the same story, that your people would risk everything in order to help those who are in need. And in this way, Father, we pray that the love of Christ might be truly seen. And Father, we pray also for those who are grieving. Uh, we can't even imagine how hard it must be for people uh, grieving the loss of loved ones in India at the moment. How horrible it is that crematoriums are full and people are left without any options. And so we pray, Father, that you would bring comfort to those who are uh, in deep grief at this time. Uh, we thank you that you are the God who sympathises with us in this, that our Lord Jesus knew what it was to grieve at the loss of his dear friend Lazarus. And we thank you that even you, Father, know loss in the giving of your own son for us. And so we pray, Father, for comfort, you who are the God of comfort. We pray that you would give comfort to those who are in grief. We pray that uh, the true and certain hope of the resurrection of Jesus might strengthen those who at this moment feel as though they have no hope. We pray, Father God, that you'd be yeah, bringing an end to this so that there would be no more uh, death and no more destruction. 
And Father, we long for that day when our Lord Jesus will return, uh, when all of these things will be put to an end and when there will be a true relationship with you uh, without any of these sin and death and destruction. And so, Father, again, we lift India up into your hands and pray that in your mercy you would work for your glory and bring an end to this pandemic. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's keep praying, friends. Uh, Father God, we just pray that you would uh, move in the hearts of other world leaders, of other nations, and and just of other countries more broadly, uh, so that people look upon India with compassion. We pray this for ourselves in Australia, but for countries all around the world. May it not be a time where uh, world leaders care only for the people of their own nation, um, but may it be a time when all people everywhere care for all people everywhere as people made in your image and precious and special to you. Um, So may the world come around India at this time, we pray, and care and share as best as possible. We pray that there may be a real generosity of spirit among other nations with things like medical equipment and oxygen and vaccines. Um, So please work powerfully in the hearts of people, Lord. We know that this this takes a work of your grace to turn any of our hearts around so that we're not selfish but generous. Um, But would you do this by your grace in the power of your spirit? Uh, Change hearts around the world so that there would be real love and care uh, and practical support for this nation in such desperate need. Uh, We want to leave before you one program that I'm aware of that uh, uh, our sister Rohina is involved in of supporting the medical staff of India. through medical staff in other countries, such as Australia, uh, a program of mentoring uh, and supporting those healthcare workers in India, um, and also a program of contributing to the telehealth services that are so desperately needed. We pray that this program uh, that Rohin is involved in may go very well and be a great help to uh, medical clinicians in India. So would you bless this program, we pray. We thank you that it's an example of generosity, uh, those who have more helping those who have less. Um, and so may this generosity work powerfully uh, so that the healthcare system can be strengthened and so that healthcare workers can continue to be resourced for that precious work that they're doing. So, Father, our prayer is for India and our prayer is for the world to come around India and to support this nation in this desperate time. Would you do this work? And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just keep leading us if you're happy, friends.